we are going to learn to paint watercolour. More precisely, we are going to learn how to paint fish. Hi, it's Julia from Julia K Art Studio, and since it's Wednesday, I can make a video about whatever I feel like. And today, I felt like I wanted to learn more. And I love learning to paint more and better and other things with other materials and other subjects. So, I decided I want to learn how to paint from a magazine. Yes, so I have spent quite a lot of time on YouTube, on Skillshare, um, on Pinterest, finding ways to learn how to paint. And I think that is a lot of fun and great value. But I have a quite a few <laughs> number of magazines that I have bought because I was like, I need them. This one is something that I picked up. It was quite expensive. Uh, a lot of these uh, painting magazines that comes to Sweden are very, very marked up. But this one was animal painting. And I love painting animals. And this is, um, this magazine was advertised at 100% practical. And I was like, I need that. So <laughs> I picked it up, I looked through it, and I was like, I want to do that, I want to do that. Uh, but I don't think I can. Yeah, uh, I think some of you might recognize that feeling that, yeah, it looks really good on the magazine, but when you, like, sitting down, you're like, but there's no way I can do that. So, finally, three months after I got it, I decided I'm going to pick one article, I'm going to follow it and see what happens. So that is what we're going to do today. The article I decided to follow is written by Andre Mehu, Mehu, and it is an article painting koi fish with a really fun technique using a lot of masking fluid and rich vibrant colours. So let's see how it goes. So if we look at the nice magazine here, we don't have a really good overview of what he's actually painted. I mean, this is more about practicing the technique, but I still want to be able to follow along. So, and the thing I'm really annoyed by is that the image we have here of the actual, like the closest th thing we have to a drawing um, in the finished sketch or the finished painting here, uh, it's not the same way. That is the same, but this isn't. So that is that, but we don't have those two together anywhere. So yeah, let's um, let's just see how we can do that. I have never painted or drawn fish before, so this will be interesting to say the least. Okay. Um, just going to see if you can see too. So we have a leaf here. Anyway, that is going off the edge. So let's try to get that sort of in there. Um, I think that is about the right size of it. And then we have a fish that is, or a koi, that is about here, I think, with a fin. So I have this brush that isn't very good. It's just a, a flat a flat brush. Um, and I have a jar of dirty water here, so I still need to clean that. But what you can do is use some soap to protect your brush. It, it won't save it, but I might be able to use it a few more times. And that smell of masking fluid. I'm just going to do that and make sure I coat my brush. If I do get soap in it or anything, I also don't have to have the the cork off the masking fluid. So. Okay, let's let's begin.
Okay, so I've done all the masking fluid on this stuff I have drawn out, but what we need to do now is add in the masking fluid that will be like the splatters and like the ripples on the water. So here you can see a bit clearer where they have added that in. And uh, yeah, I suppose we're just going to town. Oops. Um, yeah, so we have one goes there. <laughs> Okay, then we have over here on this one, and looks like he went that way, and then another one was not quite as powerful, but like that. And then we have over the tail here, and looks like he started hmm, close enough, I suppose. And then that, um, and then, yeah, and then just some splatters which I like I like splatters so so I've changed out the water so that is clean water after we have done this now apply hands the yellow adding some water if the pigment is too thick place the darker tonal values with the cobalt blue turquoise cobalt green and cobalt turquoise okay um I don't have those colors so this is my palette. It is just um, every color I have, is pretty much. So, but what we're going to start by doing is I'm just going to take a big mop brush that is very soft. And I'm actually going to do it like this first. So if I don't tape down my, my paper, I like to wet it on both sides. And they tend to lay a lot flatter if you do that. So. so what we want to do is have a uh, rich yellow, a blue, green and turquoise. But I do have all of those here. So let's just start. I'm going to go in with Maya yellow uh, dry colours. I'm just looking to see if I could see where he is placing but I can't, so. I had a really hard time finding a yellow that I like. If you um, watched my vlog the other day when I was testing out pigments, you might have, <laughs> have gathered that I do like yellow, but I have a hard time finding a yellow that I actually like. And, um... When I find the Maya Yellow by Daniel Smith, I was very happy because I really like this one. For me, it's uh, a good, um, good middle yellow. So he uses quite a lot of cobalt and I don't have a lot of cobalt because, yeah, I just don't. But I have uh, two of them, so I'm going to use is that. Um, and now we're going to go in with some darker values. I'm going to go in with Prussian Cobalt, Ultramarine and Indigo. I only have Ultramarine and Indigo on my palette when it comes to darker hues. And uh, we're going to add them like shadows to make them the, the stuff on top of the water to stand out. I do have Delft Blue, I'm actually going to go in with that. And I'm going to imagine that the light is coming that direction. Just so it will look sort of good, consistent. Something like that, could that be right? Honestly, I can't tell from the pictures on the, uh, on the article, so... Yeah, and even though it looks really strong right now, we all know what colours will fade. I'm going in with more indigo. It will fade quite a lot, so I'm not too afraid to go in quite strongly. I think this area might be too light. Let's see. Uh, we're going to go in with some magenta 
to add shadows around the fish without going into too much detail and add some water if it's not wet enough. Uh, mine is wet enough. So I'm going to pick up another, another soft brush. I'm going to go in with the Icon number 12 from Jackson. And we need some magenta. I'm going to go in with uh, the closest thing I have on my palette, which is Quinacridone Rose from Daniel Smith. I mean, he says it's going to be shadows around the fish, but where I can see it here, place the magenta is nowhere around the fish. I'm going to place it where I can see it on the on the painting. So. And the thing why he said a damp brush is I assume that his painting by this stage was drier than mine are and if you go in with a wetter brush at this point you will get a lot of blooms. So that's why you want to have a drier brush at this stage. Okay, I think this might be... But then he has like a super orange right here. He doesn't look right. Like that. And I think I want to darken up the area up here. I'm going to go in with Delft Blue first. A bit of turquoise. Maybe some indigo. Oh, Albert, he wants to go out. But he can't go out now! We are in a very critical stage. Yeah, I think I really like how this is turning out. Uh, I like that we still can see different colours. Hey, Albert. Uh, but I definitely feel like I need more darkness up here, just to sort of to frame the piece a bit more. I'm going to go in with more, a little bit more here. That was not the one I wanted. <laughs> Oh. Just something like that. We are going to let this dry and the next step will be to remove the masking fluid. Step now when this piece has been drying. You can see it has buckled a little bit but considering how much water I had on it uh, it's not too bad and that's because we wet both sides. So. Um, so now we're going to remove the masking fluid. Okay, so now I have <laughs> removed the masking fluid. Um, with a little adhesive thingy and all I'm going to do is go over and feel with my fingers that it's all all gone and I did wash my hands before I came to the studio okay so that was step nine before we are going to paint the water lilies now and here it says to use a green gold I don't have that quinacridone gold Amazonian light yellow and quinacridone burnt orange on the water lilies. Add your touches at random. Alternate warm and cool tones and don't be afraid to mix the colours to get nuances. Splatter cobalt blue and cerulean blue along with some opera rose if necessary. Yeah, so here you can see on the finished piece that you have some pink and some blue splatters. I don't think I would personally have gone with something so yellow but it looks really nice so I'm going to try to do the same I'm going to swivel my palette to the more yellow side and uh, I'm going to pick up um, a brush that I think will be good I have a number zero quill here from Jackson uh, this is natural hair so it holds quite a lot of water um, and here it also says on number six to leave a white outline around some of the water lilies. 
All of the colors were merged together in the wet, giving shades of brown, blue, and green. Introduce intense colors around the edges of the water lily. Draw them towards the center with a synthetic brush to avoid outlines being too sharp. Okay, so we also need a synthetic brush then. So I'm just going to put one smaller one right over there. Going to make sure I have some paper and let's get started. Let's just start, I suppose. And I'm just going to go all over. So here I have some uh, Quinn Burnt Orange. Um, Quinacridone Gold. It's one of my favorite colors. Uh, the original is no longer available. The sing single pigment one from Daniel Smith. So I have <laughs> a few tubes tucked away. But I won't tell you where. <laughs> okay. And maybe going in with some, just some sap green here. Some Maya yellow. I don't know why I did this shape. <laughs> <laughs> that one it looks really odd. Okay, we should also go in with some cobalt. Was it cobalt? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry you can hear Friedolf. He is guarding from uh, the birds. You know, they are very... They are shippering away. Okay, so I also see that he's leaving some white on the on the leaves to sort of form highlights. So this white I want to, to save and I also want to save some along the edge here. To get greens, browns, yellow, uh, maybe some of this turquoise could be nice. And we also have a leaf up here. Okay, so let's go in with as a yellow. Queen burnt orange. This color is so nice, but it fades or it loses uh, that vibrancy when it dries, which is really sad. Maybe, and uh, should we go in with this turquoise? Maybe there's too much. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so we're going to switch up our brush and we're going to go with it synthetic now. Something like that. Okay, so now we're going to splatter that blue and I have this cobalt that is really nice. Uh, it's from White Knight and it's quite opaque so I think this will look really nice. I'm just going to hold my hand because I don't think I want it over the fish until I have painted them. So I'm just going to sort of use my hand as a shield a bit. And here you can see like how opaque that is and how nice that will look. I'm just going to swivel this around so I will try to do the same. And then he also said opera rose, right? Some opera rose. I don't have that on my palette. So I am I'm going to take the same one that I have here. I think that could be nice. So we have the same sort of pink, but it won't be, it won't disappear quite as much. Like that, maybe? Uh, I don't really understand because you can't really obviously see what he's doing. But it just said that the outline shouldn't be too sharp. So, and he's using a synthetic brush. So what I'm assuming by that is that you're sort of lifting up the edges a little bit so that you... Uh, Uh, yeah, uh, honestly, I don't really understand what they mean by by that. When we have masked off this area, the edges will, of course, be sharp. Because that is white paper, so... Uh, and I can't really scrub that away, so... Okay. Um, I would like, I think, to add a little bit more shadow around, but maybe that will come later, so... 
let's just do something like that. I kind of really like it. Hmm. Imagine that, huh? Okay. Step number seven. We are on to the last page. The last page of two. <laughs> number seven. Okay. Add shadows of the fish in cobalt violet. I don't have that. Add a bit of raw cyan on the body and cerulean blue. I don't have that either. For the shadows on the fins on the one in the top left. This will be, this will produce a blend of range of similar shades. The outline on the head is quite precise. Repeat the same procedure for each fish and ask yourself if the result is sufficient shaded in terms of tonal value. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, f from what I can see, he has chosen to put the light up top here. That's good because I did the same. So good for me, I suppose. Um, so for example, that is, oops. Okay. So that fish is this one. So what he wants us to do is put a light shade of blue purplish color on the side right here. Um, and then on this one right here and on this one down here to make uh, that and yeah I don't know what he puts raw sienna okay and you can see a little bit here okay so I'm going to pick up some nice cool violet it's not going so well violet grey by all Holland I had to look that up uh, and that is an opaque color, but it will look really nice together, I think. Okay. We have the fin about here, I think. And we're supposed to put the shadow there and then underneath it, I think. And I'm just thinking I might do something like that. Um, and he's talking about the preciseness of its head. Um, I don't think I have painted a very precise coy head. Uh, what do you say? Rosiana. Putting that here. And along the head. Friedolf, he is on his game today. And do something like this to precise the head. <laughs> I think. It doesn't look very good, I have to say. Uh, and he has a little bit more blue, like up here. I'm just going to add a little bit more blue right there. And then, yeah, I mean, I can't, that's the only image I have of how they are shaded. So, um, mm, yeah, I mean, I can look at the the other image but then I also wonder like how because mm, yeah, I don't know okay so here is the head on this one shaded here because what I'm thinking the swooshes we have made they're supposed to be like the moving water is obviously going to be on top of the fish but there is nowhere mentioned. So what I'm thinking is that they might be lifting that up later. So, yeah, okay. Um, uh, so this is this one maybe. Should we be using... <laughs> I'm 
laughing because I, I'm not sure what to do. Okay. On these, if I start with this one, this one has like the top fin that is like folding over, so there should be a shadow underneath that somewhere, I think. Like that, and then maybe it will be a bit deeper where it's shadow. This one should be in shadow because it's underneath. There should be a little bit of a shadow here. Uh, I mean, honestly, it doesn't really look like there's any shadow on this one, but... Eh. Something like that, maybe. A little bit. I really like shadows. <laughs> and I really like... So I don't want to go in too strongly uh, and like poking in it. I'm, I mean, I do want to do that. That's my instinct. But what I really like here that we have the different colors coming through and um, I really want to try to keep that. I'm going to add in a little bit of raw sienna on the top line here for that to sort of melt down. I also want to do that on the uh, on the fish underneath. This one will be yellow later and I would just like to add a little bit uh, for that to sort of be in the, in the shadows I suppose. Okay. Now I suppose this is supposed to be drying but let's uh, hop over to number eight. Add diluted crim crimson alizarin, alizarin crimson maybe, uh, and Windsor blue shadow for the center top fish without softening the saturation too much. Um, yeah, that's a really good instruction, dude. Okay, so it looks like you should do this while it's wet. So let's just continue. I don't have. Um, crimson alizarin or Windsor blue shadow but let's just use what we have um, I'm going to go with quinacridone burnt scarlet from Daniel Smith because that's my favorite red so uh, but I think alizarin crimson has some more pinkish tones so I'm going to mix a little bit of uh, quin rose into it and I think the blue, yeah, we have that quite a lot. So, mm, okay, I mean, it doesn't have to be the same, but he has here. I think we need some more water for this to look good. Oh, it looks like a, a sort of diagonal over the face here. It looks like he has a wet fin and then just dragging that paint out to it and that will be the sort of definition for the fins. Something like that maybe. Like that. And then on the other side it's supposed to be more like in shadow. So let's just mix it with Delft Blue. So here, the fin, maybe a little bit there, here, completely filled in, but almost. Okay, I'm just going to stop there. I'm going to try and do that. It leaked into the other fish a little bit too much. Yeah, I think that is the best I can do, honestly. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, number nine is... Yeah, I, mm, I'm sorry, I don't really understand. Because he's talking about... 
So in this fish, that one, refine the shadows and contrast. Yeah, I mean, okay. I add a red that is quite dark, magenta and Prussian blue, in the wet paint on the central fish. So from what I gather, the central fish already has a red in the wet paint on the central fish. So what paint is the central fish from the start? So that the contra contrasting va um, tonal values bring the four crimson alizarin creates a halo that eases the color transition. So is that the alizarin crimson before and then? Uh, I feel so stupid. Okay. Um, let's, um, let's start by wetting the fish. Okay, just... And um, let's just start by our own Alisar and Crimson mix. Because I suppose that is what he's meaning. So... I don't... Mm. It goes a little bit more on that side. Okay, and then we're supposed to be mixing the magenta and Prussian blue. I don't use Prussian blue. But I do use Delft blue, which is um, a cool blue. No, it's not. It's a warm blue, but... Do I have a cool blue? No. Nope, I don't use a lot of cool blues, to be honest. Like that? And then it looks like this colour is just used to do the same thing, where you sort of drag it out. I want a smaller brush. <laughs> uh, let's do a silver black velvet number two. And get a little bit more. And on the fins the same where you use this and just sort of, I suppose, drag it up. So you get the sort of fin. Number nine. We're moving on to number ten. To stay in the same tonal value as the shadow, I add some blue designs to the color areas on the top left fish. Oh, that one. But it's not on the one on the image. I add spots of perline brown and indigo or ultramarine, carmine for the light side and crimson alucine on the other side of the top center fish. Um, I finished the last carp with light cadmium and orange dark and with raw amber and brown. Okay. So uh, adding a little bit more blue and brown to get um, more tonal values. And then to finish the last carp, which is the one underneath here. It still hasn't talked about this one, but maybe that will come. Um, Last carp with light cadmium orange, darken with raw amber and brown. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's see here. We're working on this little guy then. So let's go with ultramarine. It looks like he used ultramarine. I think I will go in with indigo and like refine this edge later maybe. I don't really like it now. And I'm really trying to stay loose so I'm keeping like the way I'm holding the brush is quite high so that I can't go in and nitpick too much because boy would I like to. Something like that. It also looks like he then splatter with like orange and blue to get some texture on it. But for now, we're just going to add in the head, the head dot, I suppose. Uh, well, this one is still at, I want to go in with the ultramarine and brown, like that. And then we have some, I do really like working with ultramarine this way because it's so, um, it's a strong, nice color, but you also get a lot of, because it granulates, you get a lot of texture from it. Okay, something like that. Let's work on the uh, the one the the forgotten one, <laughs> the one underneath here. 
that is going to be more yellow and orange. So I don't have cadmium on my palette. I can definitely say that is something I've noticed here, that we have very different palettes. I don't have a lot of cobalts or um, cadmiums. I know those are very traditional pigments, but I just like to stay away from them, so. Okay, so here what we want to do is to keep, uh, because the fin top here is going to stay white, so I'm just going to try to keep the white. Like that. And then... So it's almost completely orange, but it has a lot of different sort of values. And I want to, I would like to achieve that. Here, this is orange, and it's the same thing here where you get the orange. Ah, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, you don't see the original picture right now, so that's fine. <laughs> okay, so I suppose this is supposed to be drying, to leave the fish uh, to dry. We still haven't done anything to that one, but maybe that will come. Um, flowers, ev and movements, the finishing touches. Oh, we're getting close. Use green gold and quinacridone gold to, uh, to simulate the stamens of the final water lily flowers. I only have one. He only has one too. Add some cobalt blue for the shadows of the petals. The small water lily will get a um, con condensed uh, repetition of all the different colors present on the paper. Yeah, and I think I would have done the same too. Um, with this element, so the colours I have used on the fish to echo in the flower. I think that's very clever. Um, oh, that's it. Okay, let's see if we can do that. Um, so, I suppose, I'm guessing, um, and just doing it like that. I'm going to switch my brush. And then... I like to keep it as white as I can, but I still want to get the colours to look like they should be there. Mm. I think if I add a little bit of... Uh, I don't know. I feel like indecisive. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to leave that for now. Uh, number 12. Now work on the reserved areas of white to represent the movement of water. Change the water again, blur the outline left by the drawing gum so that the form fit with the background. Uh, some water down Windsor Blue will provide a reflection of water and achieve an overall hermo harmony in the work. Okay. Uh, yeah. And this is what I like. It just said work on the reserved areas, which are these that go over the fish. And yeah, I what I gather and from what I can see, it looks like they have scrubbed away. So I'm going to take a brush that I can do some light scrubbing with. So I haven't used uh, thalos or um, those kind of colours are very, very staining, but I mean, this is a art cold pressed paper. If I had used a cellulose paper, um, 
then this would be a lot easier because you can lift quite a lot quite fast. Now he hasn't got his paper back to complete white. Um, I mean you are still supposed to be able to see the colors underneath and I'm just using um, now I'm using a filbert it's a pro art uh, proline plus um, it's a synth synthetic brush don't scrub with natural hair um, there's no way there's no reason to to do that to natural hair they deserve better <laughs> No, but it's it's true. You use synthetic brushes, they hold up a lot better and uh, natural hairbrushes should be be taken care of. So I think that is all that I can do without uh, going too far into the paper. Uh, we're going to add in some blue to that, but I don't want to do that until that is dry. So I'm going to add in uh, some details that I feel like I haven't added in. I'm going to to add some more details that I that I can see in the painting, but it's not mentioned, and I will come back when it is dry. I just need some some pillows to sit on. My final thoughts about learning from a magazine. In conclusion, I would say that I am very happy with my my final piece. I'm I think it was very fun. Um, it's very vibrant and using color in a way that I don't normally do. I tend to mix a lot of color on my palette, which is not done here. <laughs> it's taking. Um, colors straight and then letting them mix and be themselves on the paper which I think is really fun. Um, I also really like playing with transparent and opaque colors to get the different splatters effect and that kind of stuff and uh, yeah I feel like this is a very in in the in heart of it is a very easy and simple technique to work on the background with masking fluid and then go into the details but definitely the fact of using strong vibrant colors straight as they are and not mixing them as much is something I hardly ever do so that was really fun and uh, yeah that was uh, something I will take uh, from this little class. How was it to learn to paint uh, from a magazine? Well I have a few pros and cons so Keep in mind, we are only using this article as an example. So this is the only one I have done. This uh, magazine, of course, has tons of them. Should we start with the cons and then finish with the positives, maybe? I would say that the first thing that I feel is really not ideal is that the instructions are so limited. I mean, all of the content of the class is limited to what you can fit on a spread. In this case uh, there are other classes in or um, articles in this that takes up um, for example here we have one that is two pages but still I mean it's the the instructions and the information is limited to our space of how much text and pictures you can fit in uh, and the same goes with the photos and also that we a lot of the photos are, for example, the first one here that illustrates the, um, the start of it quite well. Um, it was the only one um, where I would have wanted to get, you know, this image. So I knew what I was going to draw. Uh, but this is not the piece we worked on. Um, but yeah, so limited text, but also limited photos. And what I have to say about the photos is that even though we have quite a lot of photos here, 
a lot of very pretty photos, but that the photos are cropped in, which makes it quite hard when the text is talking about several different things or uh, isn't really illustrating what the text is talking about. So that is a con that you are very limited to what photos you have in the article. Uh, and also something is that you need to think more. Uh, I felt that it was several times I needed to stop and think and evaluate what, I'm, what I was doing, uh, what I should be doing next. Um, even though that could be a positive, when you have something that is going to teach you something, I think it's best to let the the person that is learning something think as little as possible. I mean, in general. Um, also, I felt like it was a bit tricky to understand. Now, this could be down to several different reasons. It could be that I have a hard time reading. I am a very slow reader. Um, dyslexia. Uh, um, it could also be that English is not my first language. I feel very confident and uh, I speak English quite a lot, obviously, uh, and I read a lot of English, but that could be something why I had a hard time. It could also be that the author of the article doesn't have English as their first language um, and that sort of disconnect. Uh, but I'm not meaning to harp on Andre, who has written this article, that he's not good in English. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that that the written word can be quite easily to be hard to understand or misinterpreted. I mean, you can just take the example of you sending a text to somebody or you get a text from somebody, how easy that is to misinterpret. So that is just something to keep in mind. And I feel like um, in today's society, we are so, we are not used to take uh, instruction from written words. We, if we want to, to learn something, we watch YouTube or we, we talk to somebody, but we very rarely read how we're going to do stuff. And uh, yeah, that is just something to keep in mind. And uh, on that note, my final con to learning from magazine to paint is that you need to stop and read. It could be a good thing that you need to stop, reevaluate, look at what you have done. But for me it was like, I was painting and I was like, what I was going to do now? And I had to stop, look through, find something in the text. And like I said, I'm a pretty slow reader. Uh, so that took some time. Like, how am I going to find what I was looking for? Um, whereas if you, example, watch a movie or um, a Skillshare class or something, you know, visual visually uh you often have a voiceover or somebody is talking about the process and uh they talk you through it and you very rarely need to stop and look what they're doing you can just hear so that is something that i um find uh, that was something different that i discovered okay but there are also very very many good things that uh comes from learning from painting of a magazine for example, you can see the whole process. In this article, you clearly see all the steps of the process. You can see where you're going at all times. In a video, you just see what you're doing right now. But here, you can see step by step of how the process is coming together. Also, um, you can reference pictures further down in the process. So for example, when I was starting out here, and doing this step when I was going to draw it, I realized this was not the picture it was actually being painted <laughs> in this article. So I could go here and watch uh, how the composition looked. Or when they were talking about splattering colors, I could watch, uh, see the last image and see like how that would look. So that is something that is very good that you can you can skip around between the images uh, to see what result you are supposed to be having. Um, uh, and another thing that is actually thinking for yourself that I just said was a con, I think is actually a good thing too. Um, just because that, now this depends a bit on what stage in the, in the painting adventure you're in, I suppose. If you're in a very early stage, thinking for yourself could be very tricky. You don't have a lot of experience, uh, or a lot of techniques to draw upon. 
and that can be quite tricky to uh, try to figure out something on your own. However, if you are further along in your journey, thinking for yourself is very good and I think you would learn a lot more. Uh, if you come across a trouble or an obstacle where you're like, I don't know what to do, and you start thinking and talking to yourself, maybe quiet, maybe out loud, <laughs> and thinking, well, how should I do this? And what happens if I do that? I think you will learn a lot more and you can take away a lot more uh, from the class or from the article. And I think the, the last thing, there is a very good thing about painting from a magazine is that you don't have any time pressure at all. You, you pick your article, you decide, I'm going to do this, sitting down, starting painting, and you do step one, and then you do step two, and when you feel like it, you continue with step three. And I think that is a thing that is very nice. You don't have any time rush, you don't need to feel like you need to keep up or feel pressured or stressed or any way. You just take the time you want, you focus as much or as little as you want on each step, and when you feel that you're done there, you continue. And I feel like that is one of the best things with the magazine versus example a video is that even though a video is easy you just hit pause but it's something different when you're just sitting alone and you decide what instructions you're going to do you decide what next step so yeah anyway that those are my pros and cons from painting from an article this is actually my first time so I, um, I was, have to say, it was a very fun process, very frustrating at times. I'm very happy with my end result. I feel like I have experienced something new. I feel like I have gotten something really valuable out of it. And um, I, I enjoy learning new stuff. And I think this was really fun. And um, yeah, I, I, I honestly feel like I have had this magazine for... Uh, it says that it returned with 52, so I've had it, had it like around Christmas. That is almost three months. And I have been looking through it and felt a bit intimidated that I wasn't able to continue, like to paint along with the steps. And and I think that is also one of the things that, um, that you can see the whole process that can be a bit intimidating. In a video where you just see, we're just going to do this and then we're just going to do that could be quite nice. Uh, but when you see the whole thing and you just, the big picture here, the biggest picture takes up most space is of course the finished piece and that is what you're going to start by looking at and you feel like there's no way I can do that. So I feel like I am a bit more ready to try another or maybe another medium. Now this is a uh, animal painting so a lot of different mediums but the the theme of it is animals and I feel like I could uh, feel more uh, ready to maybe take on another uh, one of these articles to try in a different medium even. So yeah, I feel like it was a really fun experiment and I will definitely try to do more of these uh, to paint along from a magazine. It was really good fun. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you have liked this video if you would like to see more. From the studio then uh, I post studio vlogs every Saturday and on Wednesdays we never know what will come. Hi it's Julia from Studio Love.